This is the Construction Leading Edge podcast from ConstructionLeadingEdge.com. My name is Todd DeWalt, and it's my job to help you, the construction business owner and leader, eliminate chaos and maximize profits. Got a great interview for you today with Bobby Williams. He's the owner of BGW Construction in Plainfield, Indiana. And here's what you're going to get out of this podcast. We'll talk about how being a high school football coach applies to running a construction business, how and why Bobby turned his side hustle construction business into a full-time job. We talk about developing mental toughness, some of the benefits of having a clearly defined and tight radius that you work inside of, how to turn clients into disciples. Bobby talks about how a TV show cost him $22,000 on a $100,000 project. And then Bobby shares one thing that they've cracked the code on that has revolutionized their business. Great interview, lots of good stuff. Bobby's a pretty fascinating dude. Before we get into that interview, I've got a couple of resources that I wanna share with you. Here we go. Let me ask you a question. Are you tired of second guessing yourself on the big decisions you need to make as a business owner? Ever wish you could have somebody else to talk to who has experience owning a construction business and they're not a competitor just to bounce ideas off? Do any of these four statements sound familiar? Number one, I want to be constantly learning and improving. And if somebody else has figured out a better way, I'd like to know it. Number two, I'd like to be part of something bigger than just myself, to be part of a group that's making a difference in the construction industry. Number three, I've been figuring things out on my own for a long time. Am I doing it right? Is there a better way? Or number four, I don't know what I don't know, and I would sure like to avoid the expensive learning curve. And if you've dealt with some of these things, maybe you've tried a few solutions to try to solve these challenges, like reading business books and then trying to figure out how to apply it to your business, or maybe joining a Facebook group or two and then wading through all the negativity and BS that's in there. Maybe you've joined a CEO group or a networking group, but they don't understand construction because they don't own construction businesses. And maybe you've even joined a local group of people doing the same type of work, but they're your competitors and you're not really sure how transparent they're being or how transparent you should be. Imagine being able to make confident decisions about your business. I'm talking about new hires, new systems, new processes, when to fire bad clients, when and how to grow your business. Imagine having the security and support from a group of peers who are doing the same type of work, who are not in your backyard, they're not your competitors, where you could say, here's what I'm having challenges with, how would you work through this? Well, I'd like to tell you about the Builder Mastermind Group, which is helping dozens of construction business owners solve those exact challenges. Here's how it works. When you join the Builder Mastermind Group, You'll be placed in a small group of other construction business owners who are doing similar work with similar sized businesses, and they're not competing with you. Number two, you'll have monthly calls with your small group where you'll discuss challenges and best practices around a specific topic. Number three, you'll receive an execution plan to prepare for each month's call and to have a way to figure out your action items so that you can execute on them after the call. And then number four, you'll also receive a summary of ideas and resources shared from all the small groups. In addition to that, you'll be part of a Slack channel where you can message people in your small group or people in other small groups as well. To get all of the details and see what our Builder Mastermind group members would tell you about their experience, go to buildermastermindgroup.com. That's buildermastermindgroup.com. Okay, now let's jump into my interview with Bobby Williams, owner of BGW Construction. Enjoy. All right, Bob, welcome to the podcast. Fantastic background, probably the best background I've ever seen for one of these. So thanks for doing this. Uh, How's it going this morning? It's going really well, going really well. We're finally getting some mild weather here in Indiana, and we've got a couple weeks of no, uh, no rain. So hopefully that stays the case and we can get ahead ahead on some things. So going well. Yeah. So tell us about your business. What's the name of your company? Uh, where are you located? What kind of work you do? That, that kind of thing. 
So my name is uh, Bobby Williams. I own BGW Construction. Uh, a lot of people will assume that it's named after me. Uh, it, it, it's kind of because I'm named after my grandfather, and that's who I named the company after. And uh, so uh, I've had the business since 1999, uh, but a lot of that, probably 12 of those years, were me. Uh, it was a side hustle. I was a high school senior English teacher, and, uh, and, and so it was just a good way to make money in the spring and summer. And uh, we made a financial decision back in 2012 that we would begin gearing the business for me to step away because I was working so much. I was working seven days a week. I was a varsity football coach. I was a wrestling coach. And so it was, a, it was just a lot. And so uh, when my wife and I made that decision, um, it took me a few years to sort of do the, you know, it was a side, it was all extra money. It didn't matter, you know all of these things that you have to worry about when you're overhead and, and payroll and all that stuff. I had employed some people back then, but it was, uh, you know, just by the job. And if my job made me a thousand dollars on a 10,000, if I made 10% profit, it didn't matter. And so that was the bit, my, I'm very fortunate and lucky. My wife's a CPA. She's a partner at a firm. And so she was very uh, helpful in, in that whole process. So in 2015, I left education. Uh, I was able to take early retirement, left on a, good, good note, obviously. And, and, uh, here in Plainfield, Indiana, uh, just went full-time with my company. And, uh, that same year, uh, Jason chef who operates as the general manager of BGW construction. Now he was a varsity football coach with me and a long friend. He'd worked with BGW for years. He, uh, he saw what I was doing was a bit, uh, tired of education. And, uh, and so, uh, he came with me and the two of us, uh, have really, grown this business from a, my first year out of education, or let me say it this way, my last year uh, in education. So half of that calendar year, I was teaching full-time and the rest of it, I was doing business full-time uh, from June to whatever. We did 600,000 gross, I think that year. Uh, then, <clears throat> excuse me, and Jason didn't start until December of that year. So that was me by myself. My first full year with Jason, we did 900,000 gross. And on that 900,000, we were disappointed because we set the goal of a million, which was like a lot of new entrepreneurs. It's like, oh, I think we can do a million. You know, there was no metrics. There was no business plan behind it. I think we can. So we did like 950,000, but what was left in the bank was like $6,000. <laughs> you know, our profit margins weren't very good, but everybody got paid. Mm -hmm. We were growing as a company and, and we felt good about that. And so now, uh, so that was 2015, 2016. Now in 2021, we're on track to do 1.6. That's by design. I think we could have made more money uh, gross, but we really wanted to do slow growth as we learn more about the business and expand our margins. And uh, this year, uh, we knew our minimum margin needed to be 34% average on the jobs. And uh, we, I set the personal goal of trying to get us to 50% uh, as quickly as possible. We are averaging right now, I think we're at 1.3 uh, so far as we begin uh, September, the last month of this quarter. We're at 1.3 in the bank and we're averaging 44%. So we're doing well. Uh, you know, we're doing well. And uh, I don't know how long that'll keep up, but we are constantly, we audit every job. And uh, so since Jason and I left, we've picked up Kevin Sloan. Uh, so Jason Sheff is general manager. We picked up Kevin Sloan, who's also varsity football coach. He actually still is the special teams coordinator at Plainfield High School. And Kevin's an accountant by trade. And so he's a numbers spreadsheets guru. And uh, and then we also have an office manager, Lauren, who operates this sort of all of our personal assistant and is just wonderful. Uh, and then we've got uh, three W2 employees that do a lot of our work. And we've moved. We used to have, I think, seven or eight. And we've moved to a more subcontractor heavy so that we can control our costs. There's a couple ways to raise your margins, right? The easy way is to raise your price, but also getting better at doing the job. And we can control our margins whenever we send uh, purchase orders and, and lock in a price with the subcontractor. So they're dealing with overages, uh, you know, and we don't screw them. You know, everybody has to make money or you won't have a relationship very long, but it does help us mitigate those uncontrollables. Yeah, definitely. And um, you specialize in residential renovation and remodeling work. Is that right? That is that is correct. Uh, and we're 
constantly having the conversation. You know, that was a really big paintbrush two years ago, and we've narrowed that down. We we really do a lot of kitchens and baths and outdoor spaces. Doesn't seem like outdoor spaces goes with kitchens and baths, but that keep in mind when it was a side hustle, that was almost exclusively what I did. So we are very well known for that. Uh, our best margins, we're hitting 50% margins and more on our outdoor spaces because we've got such a following with that. But then we also uh, have developed the skill set in, in old houses. And when I say old houses, pre-1920s, um, that, that presents a whole lot of different problems and issues. And so we, uh, we uh, our margins aren't as good as those. It, it's tough. We, we constantly have a discussion as, as to whether or not we want to continue that. We have an 1888 farmhouse going on right now that's a cost plus, which was a huge blessing in the this year with you know costs overruns and things like that uh it's still been a challenge to try to keep them on some sort of a budget uh but but so yeah all things residential remodel and then when we want people to call us in and then uh and then we call those people that call in um opportunities Mm -hmm. they become a prospect if we uh we ask them certain questions lauren's gotten good at that sometimes i call or a salesperson and sort of qualify them down and then they turn it if they're they're a prospect if we go to try to sell a design agreement pre-construction agreement to them yeah how um how important is it to to figure out what's in your wheelhouse or to niche down and get clear on what what really is your specialty you said kitchens and baths and outdoor spaces and uh sounds like old old houses um but how how important is it to to niche down and get to narrow your focus? It is incredibly important. My first year after teaching, I was doing theater renovations in Chicago, mm. <laughs> but I was hungry and I was scared. And the winter time is the hardest time to work here in Indiana if you're an outdoor space exclusive thing. And uh, so it, it was good. But whenever Jason came on in January of 2016, I said, your biggest goal is to help me never have to travel again and us narrow down our focus. Hmm. Jason was the defensive coordinator and he had a, uh, his probably my favorite saying of his was, you know, do what we do. What do we do well Hmm. and do what we do. And then of course that narrowed down to each individual that could be team wide or defensive wide, do what we do best. We're a four, four defense with a cover three, you know, do what we do well, let's take away these things. But then also from an individual perspective, uh, you know, do what you do well, what do you do well, you know, you're not a defensive lineman, you're an outside linebacker. And so here are your responsibilities. And this is all you don't try to cover. You do your job. And so if you take that football coaching parlance, and you translate it to the business of construction, that's what we've been trying to do for five years is figure out what do we do really well so that we can have pleased clients and get great reviews uh, and and repeat customers. And where do we make our highest margins? And so we're constantly narrowing it down. And and we, that's the hardest thing, but it's also probably the most important thing because I'm kind of a creative. I like doing a lot of stuff. I like custom projects, but we don't make great money on custom projects. So I've had to I've had to, you know, eliminate that love of mine uh, for in 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 service to other loves. We spoke um, a month or two ago, and you mentioned you work in a pretty small geographic area. We, yeah, yeah. How? Why is that? Some people would would say, well, you know, if, if it's work, if it's across town, then I'll take it. But what what are the what are the upsides? to having a pretty small circle that you work inside of? So we're pleasers. You know, Jason, uh, who is a lot more gruff and short uh, wordy than I am, uh, Kevin's uh, a lot more gregarious than probably both of us. He's just a lovable teddy bear. And, uh, you know, so we're pleasers. And and we, if we have too much going on, then we we're gonna somebody's gonna we're gonna fail somebody Mm -hmm. and we generally okay believe that if we have an upset customer i would say nine or eight or nine times out of ten it was our fault whether it was communication or we weren't on site enough to manage the project or whatever that 20 percent you can't 
you know, those are just a whole clients that you can't do anything about. And we've tried to qualify them out. We've tried to come up with characteristics and red flags that we don't want to work for you. And the pre-construction agreement is really helpful with that because we get to date for a little bit and find out if this is the person. So to answer your question, as far as geography, you know, we're a small company. Jason's got four boys, you know, Kevin's a coach and, and has two girls that are in college, but still he's got a family. I've got uh, still three kids at home and and, you know, one of my promises to my wife when I left teaching was so that I could sort of control is an illusion, but control my schedule a little bit more. So we don't want to be working after five o'clock. And uh, so the tighter of a radius you have, the more you can be present on the job and make sure that the client gets a superior product and an experience. And that those clients then become your disciples you know, and go out and, and they, you get like-minded clients that, Hey, I'm not as much worried about the bottom line of what everybody has a budget, but they're willing to pay a little bit more to get a great experience. And when we're 45 minutes to an hour away, it's a lot of work for us as a company for that benefit. And, and, and it, and it reduces our margin and our margin isn't just a bottom line, it's quality of life. Mm. And so, so those are the reasons that we do now. We do try to work in a radius of Plainfield and then in our Hendricks County, right? But we're taking, I just landed a job in Indianapolis. It's about 35 minutes away in an area that I don't like to work in, but there's a lot of money there mm-hmm. and it's a good project and it, and it's a kitchen, something that we can, we can do. And, and, and I've got a, I've got a subcontractor that is so good that he can kind of also operate as a project manager. And so we just put that in our quote. And, and we manage the project uh, from an email standpoint and uh, and go from there. So yeah. does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, I love the idea of making your clients, how your clients become disciples. Yeah. Um, so let's shift gears. This is a, I, I think it's, it's relevant for entrepreneurs, but for selfish reasons, um, I recently, recently became a high school head volleyball coach. And one of the challenges is how do you develop, and I've been asking a lot of people this question, every athlete, every coach I can run into, how do you develop mental toughness in somebody else? Like what sort of situations could you put them in? Well, first of all, is it possible to help somebody develop mental toughness? And if so, how do you do that? Um, I think that some of it is natural. I think, unfortunately, and and keep in mind, I'm an optimist. I mean, I love people. Uh, One of my biggest challenges when I'm hiring people is I pretty much like everybody. And then I find out they're, you know, this terrible person down the line. And so I kind of look at everybody with the glasses half full. And I don't think Jason would be offended by my saying that he does have a different perspective and he can sort of see through people. And I don't think Jason is cynical whatsoever. But he's a he's he's a better judge of character and doesn't just believe people for what they say. And I I would venture to say uh, I'd be curious as as to his input and also Kevin's. But I would venture to say that uh, there are some people that you just can't develop mental toughness. Hmm. Uh, They they you know it's you know you you learn mental toughness by your your experience right. And we don't when you're coaching a young team. uh, Did you say you're a varsity uh, volleyball coach at a high school? Yeah. So your challenge there is a little, I would say it's easier and harder. It's easier from the perspective of the kids, if they've stayed around long enough to make, <coughs> to be a varsity athlete, they've developed some mental toughness. Um, when you're doing seventh grade and younger or freshmen, uh, they haven't necessarily gotten there yet. And so you're kind of a slave to what their parents have taught them. Mm-hmm. And we live in a culture here in, in America where our kids, our, my life was better than my dad's life. You know, his life was better than his grand. Our kids are better, you know. And so my kids don't have the challenges that I had growing up, you know, being a latchkey kid that I left at, you know, eight or nine and went out with my friends and, at you know, at 12 years old and came back. So long as I was back by five, it was fine. And uh, very, I'm going kind of broad here, but to narrow it down, what we would try to do in it all, the success was dependent on your leaders, you know, on that team, which is different. But we would try to put kids in tough positions in in practice. Mm. We would early on, 
try to find out who your quitters are. Mm. And, uh, and you can do that in preseason, you know, and then those quitters, you don't put them in a position to have to depend on them. And, uh, and they either sink or swim, you know, there's no lesson like riding the bench. And then you have that very honest conversation with them. Look, you know, I see quit a lot, you know, and, and maybe you don't say it that harsh, you know, but, but you try to get them to understand it. Cause that is, you know, you're dealing with people that God's not finished with yet. Right. You're dealing with people that are still growing. And so you try to put them in positions of failure and anybody who's coached and it's the same philosophy. We co- we run our business. Like we're coaching. Yeah. We learn a lot more from failures. You know, I think about a loss or a win that we had several years ago where we won the game. Like it was like 46 to 42. It was a basketball score. Right. And uh, we did, you do a lot of things wrong defensively if the team scores that many points. The next day, Saturday morning, the team was in a good mood. We won. So they weren't really open to learn what, what they did wrong. Mm. But when you lose a game, seven to nothing, you know, and much tighter score, probably a better defensive game. But all of a sudden, that deep, what could we have done different, mm. you know? And so you learn more from your failures. So trying to get your, your players to fail in practice so that they can learn how to recover from that emotionally so that they're not doing that for the first time in a game is how I think that's how I would say it. And I think it, you know, you hopefully you don't do that in a business. You get rid of the people that we're professionals now, right? If somebody's failing constantly, they don't stick around very long. We can go get somebody who's not a failure. Yeah. Yep. So how, how important is mental toughness to somebody who's planning on starting a business? If you don't, and it's hard to gauge that for yourself because I'm sure that everybody thinks that they have great mental toughness, but I can tell you uh, that it, it is it is incredibly important. I'm a man of faith, and so that was a big a big help for me as well. Um, you know, but everybody approaches it. You know, there's other people in my business that aren't people of faith, but they've got great character and great. It doesn't. It's not like you have to have that, but it, you have to have something. You have to have whether it's a you know a wife or a spouse or or a father, you have to have something that gives you that, uh, cause you're going to, I'm a problem solver. And I think entrepreneurs in general are, don't tell me, no, it's not impossible. It might cost more and be tough, but it's not impossible. And I could tell you so many stories about the buildings that I'm sitting in right now, how many times just in the last six years, when it became a real business, that I have some sleepless nights and some huge concerns and, and some deep seated prayers. But, um, but you just, I don't believe anybody fails at business or very many people fail at business. I think most people just give up hmm. and, and that's okay. Sometimes you should give up. Sometimes you're not, it's not the right, you, you're not it, leading people is tough and having the weight of, you know, 40 people, not just W2 employees, but our subcontractors that are exclusive, we're feeding all of them. We're feeding their families. We're paying their bills. The work coming in is important. And that that, that could weigh on you if you don't have mental toughness. And I would say when I'm interviewing people, uh, that is something that we try to ascertain is, you know, is this person a quitter? Is this person, you know, if you see somebody that's 27 years old and they've had seven different jobs, you know, unfortunately, that tells a story, yeah. you know, whether they got fired or they gave up. Yeah, I, think that's I don't know if that point. answers your question. Yeah, it, it definitely does. Um, and, and my advice to someone who's, I think there are probably a lot of people listening to this who are in the process of turning their side gig into a full-time business or planning for their full-time business. And uh, my advice to them would be develop mental toughness on your own proactively. It's sort of, it goes back to the, the, um, if you're a football or volleyball player, the first time you deal with those emotions should not be in a game, right? You, if, if the first time things don't go well, it's in the middle of a game and people are watching and, or in the case of business, there's a lot of money on the line. If you can't manage your emotional response, then you, you're going to get yourself in trouble. So I think this is often overlooked. There's a lot of focus on skills and raising money and using software, but there's a lot of underlying 
foundational stuff that the people who are really good at it develop it over the course of years, like mental toughness and decision making. And you mentioned problem solving. These are all like foundational things that make people good. And a lot of people, I don't see a lot of training on mental toughness. I don't see a lot of training seminars on decision making, but these are the kind of things that make people successful. And my Mm -hmm. advice would be proactively develop your decision making and problem solving and so that kind of thing. So true. And if I could piggyback on that, I'll say two things. I also grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. And so I was sort of, it was ingrained on me and making, make a decision, right, wrong, or indifferent, make a decision. Then I went into coaching and I would say, if you want to get a lesson in how to develop mental, to- co- mental uh, toughness, I would get into coaching if you've got that skill set or something, because there's nothing more uh, character building than being on the sidelines on a Friday night with five or 6,000 people that all are experts, right? <laughs> and, and they're telling you, you know, you make a call and it doesn't go right. And they're all telling you what they think of you and, and you know, and, and not so many good terms and the emails that you get and things like that. And we just got, you know, right here, you can't take it personally. Yeah. They don't, some of them, even when they mean it, you just can't take it personally. The contractor fight guy, I always forget his name. You know who I'm talking about? Yeah, on Tom Reber. YouTube. Yeah, he's fantastic. Uh, and, and you know, one of the things that Tom has on the back of his board is something like, uh, you know, don't take it personally, you know. And and so, and, and that's so true. You just can't, you know, it's, you, you, you check your emotions. Emotions never make things better, whether they're yeah. good emotions or bad emotions. When we had a quarterback or a safety that was emotional, it didn't make for a fun season. You know, you've got to really have a short memory. And whenever you make a mistake, you got to learn from it, but you can't dwell on it. Okay. You freaking screwed up. You fumbled. Let's just not fumble on the next play, you know, and you just got to, you got to move past it. And I I think the only real way, and probably one of the reasons is there's not a whole lot of classes on it. The only real way is trial by fire. You got to put yourself in positions to, and I don't know how you do that. I'm blessed because like I said, my background with the family, watching that happen, watch them almost go out of business and then come back and almost go. And the whole business burned down in 91, mm-hmm. like that my grandfather almost lost everything, you know, and then to go back into coaching, you know, I've been coaching my entire adult life for 20 years. And, uh, and that is, you know, putting, I don't know how you do that. If you don't, I don't know, I don't know what other, those are my two experiences, but find some way that you can challenge yourself and experience some failure where it's not going to cost you a great deal of money. But but to learn how to deal with with failure because you're going to fail. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's we're not, not ain't none of us perfect. Yeah, and I think um, what you mentioned about coaching is you have to make a decision. Clock's winding down. You, yes, you can't <laughs> you can't not make a call. You have to do something. Best information available. Make a decision. Iterate because unlike a lot of life, when you're coaching not making a decision isn't an option. And I think where a lot of people are is they just, they just don't make a decision and they just yeah. procrastinate they kick it down the road, yeah. kick the can down the road and we'll figure that out later. And the business never starts or they never pull the trigger or uh, like with hiring, for example, what I see is a lot of people are like, man, I am, I need to hire somebody, but I'm, I'm scared to do it. There's I'm nobody sure. out there. They're out there. Yeah. But They're, you haven't done anything to go look for them. Right. And then when you, what I see a lot of times is you, you get a good lead on somebody and then because of, I I would call it strategic foot dragging sometimes. (laughs) Yeah. Like, "Ah, I'm just going to wait and maybe this person will go away and then it won't be on me and I can just blame the universe. Yep. Yep. Good stuff. My grandfather used to say, and I love this. He used to say, just begin. The rest Mm -hmm. will take care of itself. If you're cleaning your bedroom, just start. Yeah. And then you'd be surprised at how fast it happens. You know, the thing that I hate about this business is developing the scope of work and, and the money that goes into it. It's time consuming. I don't like sitting in front of a computer and I, I'm an English major, right? I'm not a math guy. So I, 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 but once I start, I usually knock it out relatively quickly. It's not yeah. as painful as I thought it was, but just begin. And, and if there's anything, you're a hundred percent right. There's nothing like Friday night, for me, football, you know, you're in 
you know, you're in the foxhole with your buddies. You've spent countless hours. The football team has, you just don't have that reproduction. You have little bits of it when things just go great on a, on a client for one thing. And it seemed like a big, but we used to also say as coaches adapt, adjust and overcome. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be perfect. We're going to go into Friday night with the game plan based on all of this data. And then in the first series, they come out and they're doing something totally different that we weren't expected. Okay. We can hang our heads and be like, Oh shit. Or we can adapt, adjust and overcome. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. So let's talk about, um, we mentioned failure and failure is unavoidable for the most part. Um, how has a failure or apparent failure, what appeared to be a failure in the moment, how's that set you up for later success? Oh, the first thing that always comes to mind, and Jason would just be laughing right now if he were sitting here, um, is we had an opportunity in 2016, 2017, where HGTV came down and filmed our company. And uh, we were doing old houses in downtown Indianapolis. And we were working alongside Good Bones, if anybody's seen that. So they were brand new. They they had, I think they they were filming their first season and HGTV was looking for that next one. And another thing that we were doing a lot back then is Barnwood and they had Barnwood builders. So they really liked our company from that. So I tell that whole story because that whole experience, while it was really fun and emotionally, uh, you know, an ego boosting, you know, uh, we did like, it was like six months they filmed. We got to the final table, almost a show. If Jason were as pretty as Nina on Good Bones, I think we'd have gotten it. But unfortunately he pees standing up. And, uh, and, and so we lost $22,000 on an over hundred thousand dollar remodel that we were doing. And a big part of that was self-inflicted. We wanted to give, we wanted to do things that the homeowner couldn't afford. Um, we, and so we did it because we knew it would translate well to the camera and, uh, and there were other things and we didn't know the business like we do now. And, uh, and so that. I mean, I don't think anybody would deny that that was a failure, right? I've got a neat, several neat videos and a great experience, but from a business standpoint, you can't justify $22,000 loss, which would be, which would kill most companies. Um, But you just go back and again, it goes back to unemotional. What are the, what are the metric reasons that we failed there? What, what could, what was self-inflicted? What were some things, you know, change orders became a lot more important after that experience and billing for them appropriately. Uh, And and so that failure, you know, we've had other smaller failures. We view a failure now if we don't if we make money, but we don't hit our 34 percent margin. Mm -hmm. We view that as a failure. And what can we do from that? And so I think the key and this also goes back to mental toughness and decision making is understanding your numbers at just an incredibly specific rate. I, again, I'm, I, I would not, I must tell everyone that might be listening to this, we're unique as a construction company. I've got three college degrees, Jason has three college degrees, Kevin's got college degrees. You know, I've got three people in my administrative staff that are way overqualified to be contractors. So we're not intimidated by computer programs, we're not intimidated by the data um, and all that stuff. If you are intimidated by that, there are companies out there that can help you with it and feed you these documents, the P&L statements and these documents that you can, you tell them this is what I, and they're not that expensive. You'd be shocked at, at how little money it would be and how much return on that investment. But knowing those numbers, like I said earlier about coaching, you, you don't always know exactly what to do, but you have more confidence because you at least understand the numbers. And, uh, and that, so again, long-winded, uh, Todd, but, but understanding your numbers will give you more confidence. It will help you with your emotion because then you become much more statistics based and everything, everything's not on numbers, but it's a big part of it. When you're business, there's, there's no scoreboard. The scoreboard is at the end of the year, how much money is left in the bank account? And did we all get paid? Mm-hmm. That's your scoreboard. And everybody's on the same team. If I want to fix you or, or somebody wants to, Jason wants to fix me. I don't get, per, I don't take it personally it's for the best of the company. You know, there's no defense mechanism or anything. What needs to happen to make the company run effectively so that we all, we can all continue to do what we enjoy to do and live the lives that we want to enjoy. We're not here because we like each other. Although we do, we're here because we get a paycheck. And that's that understanding that is, is 
monumental. Yeah, yeah. One of my other favorite questions is this one. Uh, I've received lots of interesting answers to this. I'm curious what your answer would be. What is one thing that you believe to be true about business that some might say is unconventional or even a little crazy? Oh, man. This is tough because it's sort of like asking a fish, what does water taste like? Because it's just the way you think. But what anything come to mind for that question? I mean, I, you know, that's a tough one. Uh, I would say business is, is a living, breathing thing, you know, and that sounds crazy when you say it, but it's constantly growing or it, it, let me say it this way. Business is like an escalator and it's going down and you have to fight to go up. If you stand still and you're not constantly pressuring yourself, you know, pushing against that rock, then you're going to be going backwards. And so in that same vein, I don't know, I, I hope that this kind of answers your questions. It's a, you got to look at it like it's a person, it's an individual. And if you're not feeding that person that Jason calls it a monster, that's always hungry. You know, if you, if you're not feeding the monster, and feeding it good stuff, you know, feeding it good employees, good subcontractors. And, and if you've got a bad subcontractor or employee, you can't wait to let him go, which is my big problem. You know, again, it's an emotional decision, not a business decision. I am looking at that individual, but I'm not looking at how that individual is affecting everybody else around him from the bottom line to emotional well-being. And these are the people that I'm going to keep. These are the people that are loyal, right? So you got to cut that cancer out as quickly as possible. And so running the business, not like a family. I don't, I used to like that. I used to use the family thing, but that's, I don't think that's fair and it's not accurate because um, family doesn't come around only because you've got money uh, to, to pay them. Right. But it's an, it's a, it's a person, it's a living, breathing organism. And that might sound crazy, but I think if you do that and you're giving, and you want that living, breathing organism to be healthy then you've got to feed it nutrition. And, and that's where, again, understanding what nutrients it needs. Is that, I don't know if that's yeah, good or that's not. that's good. I, I like it. I like it. Um, so let's talk about um, your, you guys joined the Mastermind Group um, back in 2020, shortly after after it started. And um, so now it's the the Builder Mastermind Group. And I'm curious, what um, what led you guys to join that group? And what, in other words, what what problem were you trying to solve? We had a specific problem of project bleeding, um, you know, where we just, we understood that we needed to get higher margins. And we also understood that there's only so much you can ask for projects, right? Uh, everybody has a budget. Those budgets are rather arbitrary. Sometimes they're in a real world, sometimes they're not. But if you come in and you're consistently 30 or 40% over the other people, you're just not going to land a lot of jobs. And you can do great work without being that expensive, you know? And so it's the business side. I mean, Jason, like I said, is a poli sci major. Kevin's an accountant and I'm a, a, an English major in, in uh, pre-law. So we didn't really have a strong business background in relation to construction. And so we'd taken some of your master classes and we learned so much from those and uh, understood that these are people that can, can speak this, they speak our language, uh, Todd, who is the other guy that, that was part of those master classes? Uh, Spencer. Paget. Spencer. Yeah, yeah. Spencer. Uh, Spencer speaks like a coach, um, you know, using the, the language of coaches and contractors, as I tell my minister, whenever I'm, I'm asking him for prayer to work on my language myself, you know, <laughs> so, but, but there's a, there's a, just, it's a very deliberate, this is the way it is. And, and we like that. And so when you guys started offering these master's classes, we immediately saw, just like in the coaching ranks, we would always seek out other coaches in the off season. What are you guys doing? And, and we would seek other coaches that we don't play, but, but they might play similar teams. And when we'd go to colleges, it didn't really help us to go to Purdue, really, because Purdue gets different quality of athlete that we do. But when we would go to Ball State or DePaul University or um, some of these other places, Hanover, they have a lot of the same problems that we do, you know, mm -hmm. as a small company. And so, uh, and, or as a, as a small for a, at that time, uh, football team here in Plainfield or in Indiana. And so we wanted to see how they 
solve the problems that we had. You don't have the most athletic kids, right? You don't have these things. And the same thing with business. What I love what you guys do with the masterclass and Jason does too, is we can talk frankly with non-competitive companies of a like size that are doing similar things, but they're in, I think one's in Ohio, there's one in Minnesota, mm-hmm. they're all over the country. And so we're never going to compete with them. They're never going to compete with us. So you can be, there's a develop. you're not, you're not, oh, I'm going to keep this. I'm going to keep this right here. I'm going to tell you this much. Everybody's, it's an open book. We'll share experiences and documents with each other. And it, it, we will continue to do that. It's, it's, we always, Jason usually goes to those meetings as you and I talked about Todd, but he always comes back the next day with a list of, of notes mm-hmm. to say, these are the high points of what was said. And, uh, and it's been, I don't know what we pay for it, but I don't even care because it, it's incredibly, well, actually, I care Todd, so don't be raising those prices, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's incredibly important for what we do as a company. And, and it's lonely. <laughs> it's lonely being an entrepreneur and a business owner and a general manager. You know, you're making these decisions that impact the lives of your employees and your clients, all of which we're trying to please. And so having somebody else who has that experience help you navigate through decisions and you can hopefully learn by their experience that that is it's just another group of people almost like AA. I'm Bobby Williams and I'm a contractor, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, what would you say has been the most valuable part for your team about being part of the mastermind group and the monthly calls and all the, the best, all the, the idea sharing that goes along, but what, what, what would you say has been the best part? Seeing some of the concepts that we've read about in so many books and we've, we've learned in your master's classes with co-construct uh, uh, seeing these concepts that look good on paper, actually other companies implementing them mm-hmm. and the success that they have. Uh, I think that it just gives you confidence. Okay. These guys are running this defense and they've had success. So what, what, what if we did something different with our robber safety, you know, same concept. Yep. So if somebody said, uh, Bobby, why should I join the mastermind group? What, um, what would you tell them? Um, I would tell them that if you're not, I mean, that's one of the nutrients that feeds your business. Mm. It's up here and, and, and you can't do it all yourself. And, uh, you know, as a teacher for 20 years, I will tell you that we are thieves. We don't have any time as a teacher to develop our own curriculum. And so you try to find how did this person teach brave new world or, you know, Moore's utopia or whatever, uh, uh, dystopian future unit that you're doing. And then you pick, and you usually use three or read three or four of them and you pick what you want to do. And that makes my class preparation that much better for my students and faster, uh, as far as preparation, same thing in business, you've got other people that you can ask them specific questions on how did you do these things and then steal from them. And they expect you to say, and they're going to steal from you. And it's, you know, we're, that's, that's how you quickly get from barely breaking even and, 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 and having to have an equity line of credit or a credit card that you're using to meet payroll to a place where, you know, you're meeting payroll and you've got plenty of money to order your materials. And, and it's all somebody else has figured that out. Mm-hmm. What, what, what in your ego makes you think that you can figure this out? And why should you? You might be smart enough, but it's going to take you longer. So get there as quickly as possible. Yep. Good advice. So let's talk about uh, what I, I call the crack the code segment. Um, what is, let's talk about one specific part of your business that's working really well for you that you'd be willing to, to share about. What would you say is the thing that you feel like you guys have cracked the code on? The pre-construction design services agreement that we make with our clients um, absolutely radical change to my company, uh, <clears throat> our company, you know, we, uh, so the scenario, but pre us doing this before we did this was we would get a call and no matter what, we would put them on schedule and no matter what we would give them a quote. And so if we get, so our numbers work like this and we just did them last week, we need to get 400 opportunities, people that call in. Okay. We have 
over the, the data over the last year and a half since we've done these pre-construction agreements, we get 400 calls. We land about 21% of those turn into pre-construction agreements. So we're only doing 80 scopes of work in quotes, right? Because the other 80% of the people, they're, they're clearly not, because we talked to them about what their budget should be. They're not our people, mm. okay? So then those 80, we're landing about, right now, 50%. I think we can get that to 75 or 80%. You know, if, if everything works right, but we're still fine tuning how we do things. Um, another thing that I'm, I'm, I'm eager to find out from our friends in the master's class, uh, master's, uh, what do you call it? The cohort group. And then also the class. And, and so we're only, so whereas two years ago, I was doing 400 quotes. <laughs> you can't, do, there's not enough time to do that many. Okay. That's eight a week. Just so everybody knows on 50 weeks. Now we can. No, no. Is that right? I'd have to do the math. It's more than that. It's, I think we do eight a week now. Yes, we do eight a week to turn into 80 scopes of work that we hope mm-hmm. turns into 40 projects at an average of $50,000 to be a $2 million gross company. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And those are the metrics that we know. Two years ago, I was doing all 400 of those. So guess what? I'm not doing all of them. I'm going to piss off some customers because I tell them, Hey, I'll get you a quote by Friday. And I don't, because I'm looking at it and I got, I got 10 quotes to do and I'm going to put them in order. You know what? This one, I want this one. I want this one. I want this one person can't afford me. And so maybe I have time to email them and say, Hey, sorry, we're not the right company, but now they've waited several days Mm. and I've pissed them off. And so it's setting expectations. So now when we get in front of somebody, we immediately introduce our pre-construction agreement. This is how much it's going to cost. Here's the expectation balls in your court. You don't have to sign this right now. If you think about it, you know, and then if you sign it, then you give that to us and we'll immediately begin uh, trying to please you. Right. And once you've handed us money, we're going to be a slave to making sure that we give you guys uh, the information that you need. But if you decide not to sign this, you won't hear from us again because we're moving on to people that are ready to go and do work. We're serious here. And that has been a radical change in terms of our lifestyle, not having to be thinking about, you know, nine o'clock, I'm getting ready to go to bed. Oh, crap. I've got those two quotes that I didn't do. I'll just wait till Monday. And you just, you're constantly failing people. Hmm. And that does lead. If you go, go to your, I would encourage you guys that are watching this, anybody, look at your reviews. If you have those set up and look at the reviews of your uh, uh, competition, I've noticed anecdotally, I haven't done this, you know, I haven't run any numbers, but I've noticed anecdotally, uh, most of the reviews are, he came out, said he'd give us a quote and he never did. So you're getting a negative review on somebody you didn't even do work for. Yeah. So what should be a five-star review on Facebook, because all the people you've done work for, you're giving them five, you know, five stars. You're getting reviews on people that didn't even give you freaking money, Right. So you eliminate that you've communicated with them. They're not going to go, they're not going to be pissed at you and go do something. So it it does improve your reviews, which anybody who knows anything about the metrics of SEO, the Google and Facebook reviews are huge, Hmm. you know? And and so getting those, I I know it's again, I'm a long talker, but is that, did that answer your question? Yeah. So, so you guys were doing the, you were, you were doing design agreements. Um, you've been doing that for like a year and a half and then, uh, you went through the the get paid for estimates masterclass and yes, dialed that process in. Um, so what what would you say has been the the biggest benefit, the biggest impact to your business now that you're getting paid for estimates and using that pre construction services agreement? So pre pre construction services agreement that we charge for, we were doing more work. And not getting any money for it Mm. post pre-construction services so year to date january to september whatever today is seventh we have brought in about um fifty two thousand dollars in pre-construction agreement fees okay fifty two thousand so we're doing less work and i just paid for most of one of my employees okay numbers wise it's just just a no-brainer and and so so plus 
we're dealing we've we've also the 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 consequence that i won't say is unintended we knew that this would happen as soon as somebody hands you money if they're not willing to give you money to come up with a reasonable plan they're not your client and you don't want to work with them if they're a tire kicker and they want to get you know joe from you know white trashville that has a magnet on the side of his truck that's gonna you know they may or may not get good work Mm. They, if they want to, if you want to be a big boy company and you want to present yourself as a big boy company, which is a huge, you know, to, in today's world, you can create a great website and immediately compete. Those of you who are thinking about leaving your side hustle, immediately compete with the big boys by your online presence. And, and this is a great way to show value. Now you have to, you, you still have to deliver, right? You can't tell them you're going to do things and not do it. You our, our pre-construction agreement has, it's very similar to the one that that, that uh, you guys put out in that class. I changed mine. In fact, it's got deliverables. This is what you can expect. So then whenever somebody says, now, does some of this money go towards the down payment? No, no, these are two completely separate transactions. That was something that you taught me, Todd. I know you might remember in the class, it's been months, but we would use to half of the money down if it's a $4,000 design agreement on a whole house, pay us 2000. Then if you don't hire us, pay us the other 2000. Good luck collecting that other two thousand if they're not going to hire you. <laughs> you know, so then then they would be like, well, why don't we put this other two thousand towards your down payment? No, now they pay it all up front, and if they're not, we have we saw no reduction in pre construction agreements when we started collecting the whole versus half. Mm. You know, they have the money, they want a great experience, they're willing to pay for it, and if you can deliver, then your your life is going to be so much easier. Yeah. Yep. Good stuff. So let's talk about uh, something I can help you guys with. Um, I'll call this the the coaching segment. I, I had sent. Well, the question is, what's the number one area of chaos or profit bleed in your business that I might be able to help you guys with? And um, Jason had sent me this. He said, "We've been in a long process of building a master spec and selections template in CoConstruct to do all our estimating through the program." We're still estimating through our tried and true Excel spreadsheets that we've developed over the years. However, we are desperately wanting to shift all estimating over through CoConstruct. This has been quite the task. We're very close, but we're still a little leery of pulling the trigger. We've set a firm date of January 1, 2022 for full integration of estimating in CoConstruct. Any help or guidance on this front would be beneficial. So. Um, a couple of questions for you about this that I would start with. So I'll, I'll approach this like if you if you brought me into your office, like some of my clients do, and we talk about process. For I'll start asking some questions. Like number one is, what problems are you trying to solve by switching over to doing all your estimating and co-construct? The bottleneck, you know. So we'll get our design. Here's back to the pre-construction agreement. You've got a funnel. All your stuff goes in here, and you're narrowing down, right? And, that, and where that bottleneck starts, that should be a clear transition to they've given us a down payment on an actual project. So we can usually get our design work and decisions made relatively quickly, depending on how quick the customer can answer questions. Then we have an approved design. Now we have to turn that design into a number, <laughs> a scope of work. Mm -hmm. And we provide full transparency from demo down to final gate grade seed and straw with a number next to each one of them. And so <clears throat> it takes some time to do that. And we're a bit old school. We do it on a spreadsheet because it's comfortable. We know that that works. We've been using that for years and we can, we know how to read it. We know that we're not going to forget something, although we still do occasionally, we're not going to forget something and it costs the business $10,000. So that bottleneck, but it takes, it's so tedious and time consuming. We've got to almost reinvent the wheel every time we do one. And so if we can turn that pre-construction design agreement into a scope of work inside two weeks, people will probably hire us faster. That's mm -hmm. one of our ways that we're going to go from 50% to 80%. Okay. Because wow, these people get stuff done. These people are delivering quickly. You know, you're seducing them and training them. that This is kind of experience you're going to get with BGW. Yeah. And so that bottleneck is our problem. And, and we understand that the bottleneck is because we're doing it old school. And if we go to the co-construct where you've got everything sort of, uh, you know, scoped out from whether it's by square footage or whatever, and you've got, these are our normal sets of tile. 
these are our normal sets of cabinets and everything is there. And then the, you just go down and select it. Then it takes a several hour process and turns it into several minutes. Yep. So this is what I, I spend a lot of time helping people cut over from an old process to a new process. So whether it's a, a production builder who's trying to change their sales process or a commercial GC who's trying to put processes in place. So I'll share some of my best practices. And um, so number one is uh, start, I, I always start and think, how can I work from right to left? So let's go out to the right side of the page and what does finished look like? Like what's the measuring stick that's going to tell us we're done or that it's going well. And then let's work from right to left. So let's say that the cutover is January 1st. We're going to start using co-construct for all estimating. All right. What do we have to, what's it going to take to do that? And you start working backwards from that date or what has to be in place as of December 31st, you'll come up with something while well, we have to have our spec specifications and selections templates done. Okay. Well, what, what, ha what do we have to do before that? And then what do we have to do before right. that? Work, work backwards. Um, and then my next piece of advice is, well, what works really well, I found, is sticky notes. The wall, sticky notes, tasks, deadlines, and, and that way you can see it all on the so – you can see the big picture all in one, one section and you can move stuff around. And then once you have that pretty well mapped out, I would turn that into a some sort of text document, spreadsheet, step by step. Some people like to do it in workflow, like a flow diagram. Personally, I like text. I just like a spreadsheet that way you can put these things in order. So that way you see every step we have to do. This is going to be our process for how we actually estimate a step by step process, and that will tell you the stuff that needs to be done in co construct maybe somewhere else, but it'll, it'll tell you this, this is how our, our estimating process is going to go. So you design the workflow. Um, and then what I found is that not every step is equal. So according to the 80, 20 rule, 80% of your risk lives in 20% of the steps. So let's make sure we identify those 20% of the steps and really nail them at least in the beginning. There's some stuff that just doesn't matter. Like we have to change the logo on our proposal template. Well, that really is not going to move the needle. Not a lot of risk lives in that task, but um, having your your spec template or how you how you handle, how you, you estimate HVAC or plumbing, huge risk, yeah, much, yep. much bigger. Um, and then you've got a deadline. So that's, that that's a, a check mark. This is what I what I found is the sometimes the first step is give yourself a deadline. Um, the the statement I like is commit, then calculate. You put a make a commitment, you put the date out there, you tell everybody it's gonna be done, and you're probably gonna figure out a way to do it. This is how I like to get stuff done. If I have an event or if I if I'm gonna create something, the first thing I do is is I I put a date out there. And then that that way I look pretty stupid if I don't hit that date. Um, so here's a couple of other things to think about. Whenever you cut over a process, the concern is, are we missing something? How do we double check it? Yeah. What, I've, what I would recommend is instead of double checking, uh, this is something I learned from, uh, shoot, what's his name? I can't think of his name. This brilliant guy, one of the wealthiest people in the world, wrote a book called Principles. And he said, don't double check, double do. So when you cut over a process, do it, have, have somebody do it the old way and have somebody do it the new way and then compare for at least a couple of times. So double do instead of double check. And then uh, the, the last thing I'll say is um, think incremental rollout. Run some pilot tests on this new project or this new process using maybe a project that you're not that concerned about a low risk project and incrementally roll it out as opposed to just completely flipping from one to the other. So it might be, if you want to go 100% on January 1st, it might be December 15th, you're going to run, you're going to have your process nailed down and then run one estimate through that, get some feedback, iterate, make some adjustments, 
and um, and go from there. Great advice. Was it Ray Dalio? Yes, Ray Dalio. Yeah, That's a great guy. book. Yeah. Great book. It's a beast, beast of a book, but uh, yeah. a lot of great it's stuff a, there. It's a good, good read for anybody watching this, you know, and, and all, that's another thing. Audiobooks are incredible and they're incredibly cheap. We're all lifelong learners. And the more you can read, you know, the success principles, the p- principle or principles is another one. Uh, you know, there are, there's so many books out there that if you're not reading at least one a month, you know, on your business to, to get yourself better, you want to talk about mental toughness. It's another discipline that you can you can create uh, by by having that discipline. Yep, absolutely. Well, great stuff, Bobby. I really appreciate it. Um, if people want to connect with you, if they want to follow you on social media, where's the best place or places for them to go and do that? Social media, we do have an Instagram and Facebook account that I update quite a bit, and uh, that's got our most. Uh, you know, my you know social media gets updated almost weekly. Um, the website gets updated a few months apart, you know, so our most updated projects and, and a lot more detail of the projects are on Facebook and Instagram and it's at BGW construction LLC. I had to put the LLC in there cause there's another BG BGW out of California. So at BGW construction LLC, and, uh, that's also our website, BGW construction LLC.com. So Perfect. Perfect. And my emails on the website, if anybody wants to ask me questions or anything like that. Fantastic. Man, I really appreciate it. This has been great. I appreciate uh, you taking time to share and uh, yeah. and for giving me the uh, the advice on mental toughness. I'm definitely going to put that to, to good use. When will this go live, Todd? Um, probably in the inside the in in early September, I would say. Pretty soon. Okay, great. If you could uh, send us that link, we'd appreciate it. So, right on. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, man. Yep. Have a good one, man. Good luck to everybody. And thanks a lot, Todd, for everything that you're doing for the business because making everybody better makes, I mean, we all suffer from the reputations of the awful people in our community. And, uh, and I don't believe in competition. If everybody can start doing pre-construction agreements, if everybody can start giving great, uh, opportunities and things like that, it'll raise, it'll raise all of our revenues, uh, because people understand the value. So. Absolutely. Great way to look at it. All right. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yep. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye. Well, there you go. I hope you got something out of that interview. My advice, as always, is figure out one thing you want to take action on. What is one thing you want to take away from this podcast that you can put to work for you wherever you're at, whether it's mental toughness, turning clients into disciples, using a pre-construction agreement, whatever the case may be, but take something away from this, execute on it, actually get it to show up in your business and in your life. As always, check out the show notes for the links and all the resources and the notes that we talked about. As always, I appreciate the ratings and the reviews. If you could take a moment and leave a rating and or a review on Apple Podcasts or the podcast player of your choice, that'd be great. I wanted to read one from Camilla Jean, who said, Todd gets great guests with real content and experiences that matters. To those of us in construction, the conversations are engaging, and I found insights here that I've applied to my business and shared with others. Thanks, Todd. I appreciate that. If you could leave a rating, a review, that'd be fantastic. It would mean a lot to me. And don't forget, check out buildermastermindgroup.com if you are interested in joining a group of like-minded construction business owners so you can share ideas and and share resources and have the security and the confidence from coming that comes from having that sort of support. And as always, thank you so much for listening. My name is Todd DeWalt from constructionleadingedge.com. I'll see you next time. Let me ask you a question. Are you tired of second guessing yourself on the big decisions you need to make as a business owner? Ever wish you could have somebody else to talk to who has experience owning a construction business and they're not a competitor just to bounce ideas off? Do any of these four statements sound familiar? Number one, I want to be constantly learning and improving. And if somebody else has figured out a better way, I'd like to know it. Number two, I'd like to be part of something bigger than just myself, to be part of a group that's making a difference in the construction industry. Number three, I've been figuring things out on my own for a long time. Am I doing it right? Is there a better way? Or number four, I don't know what I don't know, and I would sure like to avoid the expensive learning curve. And if you've dealt with some of these things, maybe you've tried a few solutions to try to 
solve these challenges, like reading business books and then trying to figure out how to apply it to your business, or maybe joining a Facebook group or two and then wading through all the negativity and BS that's in there. Maybe you've joined a CEO group or a networking group, but they don't understand construction because they don't own construction businesses. And maybe you've even joined a local group of people doing the same type of work, but they're your competitors, and you're not really sure how transparent they're being or how transparent you should be. Imagine being able to make confident decisions about your business. I'm talking about new hires, new systems, new processes, when to fire bad clients, when and how to grow your business. Imagine having the security and support from a group of peers who are doing the same type of work, who are not in your backyard, they're not your competitors, where you could say, here's what I'm having challenges with, how would you work through this? Well, I'd like to tell you about the Builder Mastermind Group, which is helping dozens of construction business owners solve those exact challenges. Here's how it works. When you join the Builder Mastermind Group, You'll be placed in a small group of other construction business owners who are doing similar work with similar sized businesses, and they're not competing with you. Number two, you'll have monthly calls with your small group where you'll discuss challenges and best practices around a specific topic. Number three, you'll receive an execution plan to prepare for each month's call and to have a way to figure out your action items so that you can execute on them after the call. And then number four, you'll also receive a summary of ideas and resources shared from all the small groups. In addition to that, you'll be part of a Slack channel where you can message people in your small group or people in other small groups as well. To get all of the details and see what our Builder Mastermind group members would tell you about their experience, go to buildermastermindgroup.com. That's buildermastermindgroup.com. Let me ask you two questions. How many hours did you waste in the last month doing free estimates? And then how many profit bleeds like rework, lost time, schedule delays, and even uncomfortable conversations have you had in the last month because of free estimates? Look, a growing number of builders, remodelers, and commercial general contractors are getting paid to do pre-construction planning and estimating. They're getting paid for their time. They're wasting less time, maybe even no time, with tire kickers. And they're cutting out a lot of the profit bleeds that are caused by free estimates. But what could I possibly say to a potential customer to get them to pay me for an estimate when everybody else does them for free? If you're wondering that, there are three specific questions that you can ask on your next appointment to get your prospect and maybe even get yourself to see that it's in their best interest to pay you for pre-construction services. Don't send out another free estimate until you learn these three questions. Go get your free training video with those three questions over at buildermasterclass 